Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before I get to our guests here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Maggie Holmes on the podcast. She's a WNBF figure competitor. That's actually the first girl that we've had in that federation, so we can talk about that too. That's why I got a little tongue-tied and twisted there. She She's also a pharmacist, as well as a power lifter, kind of, and again, we'll get into that. She's coming to us from Texas, but first off, she's a, or I should say most importantly, she's our current guest. Maggie, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for showing an interest in me. Absolutely. So, I mean, I'm going to depress myself right now, but... What's the weather like in Texas right now, Maggie? Um, I think it's 65. It's warm. <laughs> yeah, uh, excuse me. I'm just going to, you know, just, oh my, I don't even. So it's, 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 it's 30 degrees here right now, which is warmer as it should be, but it's going to be negative five, I think, by Tuesday. So, yeah. that's not the- cold last night and it was 40 maybe, so. Okay, so before I depress myself even more than I already am just living in this climate, why don't you give us a little bit of a backstory on what inspired and motivated you to get in shape and adapt this life? So I've uh, done sports all my life, softball and basketball, and I got injured again my junior year of high school. And knowing that I was going to be going to a medical school of some sort, pharmacy or um, whatnot, I know I wasn't going to have time to play college sports, so I kind of gave that up anyways, but I'd always been working out, you know, they make you bench squat, the main three lifts. And then when I got to college, um, I went to school in Daytona Beach, so I was around, you know, the beach, skinny women 24-7. So I kind of developed into that stereotypical, like, just wanting to be skinny. Um, I have really good genetics as far as upper body goes. So, I mean, I've always had shoulders and whatnot and always, you know, lifted in the gym, but I was mostly more fixated on just being skinny, you know, 24 seven. Um, so then that was, you know, in 2007 when I'm 18. So fast forward to graduating college, move into Texas. Um, I got, somehow across the path of if it fits your macros on Facebook of all things. And typically I was one of those girls that did South beach diet, didn't eat carbs. You know, I would binge on brownies on the weekend, but I was skinny. So whatever. Um, so then I kind of got into the whole, if it fits your macros and not being scared of food groups and kind of just really got obsessed with that whole nutrition realm and teaching people that, you don't have to cut food groups out. Um, obviously, in moderation according to your genes, your work, your daily lifestyle, blah blah blah. So, um, I've always just been really well, like well off in the gym as far as my workouts go, and finally started to get into that whole building muscle phase versus just being skinny. So here I am now, still continuing the quest. Five years later, not huge. So again, women, don't be scared. <laughs> I've dedicated hours a week and still not huge. So, absolutely. Well, I was, I'll get into that question in a bit, but I first got to ask, you know, what's it like going to college in Daytona Beach? Where I mean, that's the spring break destination, yeah. but you're there twenty four seven. What is that like? Uh, it was the best decision of my life before going to pharmacy school. That's for sure. Undergrad in Daytona Beach. What more could you ask for? Um, so yeah, right on the beach. I did, for, it ended up, you know, resulting in a lot of decisions between, well, do I wait three hours to go to lab or do I just go to the beach and see what happens? So definitely skip class a lot, but here I am. I'm still alive and well. So see, I had similar decisions, but our decision was like, oh, there's two feet of snow on the ground. Do you really want yeah. to go to class then? Or, or or you'd get, you know, a lot of cancellations. So, you know, that was fine too. But yeah, Daytona Beach. Oh my God. That's just, yeah. that's just torture. Just thinking about that right now in, in this weather. But I mean, you brought it up perfectly. And I mean, so many women still have that fear, even though with Instagram, it has helped out, helped out so much, but they still have that fear where if they, you know, touch one weight, they're going to put on 50 pounds of muscle. And like I always say, you know, spend my entire life savings to talk to you. I mean, it's just, it's just a myth that, I mean, it's been getting better, but there's, it just has such a big stronghold on so many women. But did you have that fear when you were getting started? And even if you didn't, I mean, I bet you still hear that all the time. How do you like to respond to that? Yeah. So it was. I mean, I don't want to say I had it so rough, blah, blah, blah. It's definitely way easier now, like embracing, you know, built women. But I do remember a guy I dated, his family, like 
always making comments about my traps, me being like terrified to work out my traps and just get them any bigger. So definitely when I was, you know, 17 to oh, probably 22, I was definitely about, I definitely wanted muscles and I wanted to be toned, you know, I wanted just the muscles to show, but um, yeah, I definitely changed my workouts around trying not to be too big in some places. I gotta say, tone's got to be erased from the dictionary because it's like when you say yeah. tone, it's like you just want say lean and muscular. Basically, I mean that's, I, I mean I hear that all lean the time. Twenty four seven, yeah. Well, absolutely. And a, a question that sort of leads off of that is a question that I ask all of my health and fitness guests is, you know, if you're to walk into a gym with a hundred people, there's a hundred different ways as to how those people got into shape. Whether it comes down to, I mean, their diet, their nutrition, how many reps they did, what exercises they do. I mean, so many little things add up to the overall package that people end up seeing and. I always say, if you're to walk up to someone and say, Hey, what'd you train for this body part? You know, it looks great. What works best for them? 99% of the time isn't going to work as good for you. What was that like for you trying to figure out what worked best for your body? Um, I was very fortunate in undergrad. My roommate was a personal trainer. So I got, you know, into the whole, I mean, she wasn't a good personal trainer, but <laughs> she, she at least like introduced me a lot to various mindsets of rep schemes and, you know, what they could help with and what you needed them for versus, you know, some of your main squats, those rep ranges, if you wanted to fixate a program around strength and then just add in some accessory stuff. So, um, I forget the original question. Oh, so what was that like, you know, cause I always say it's almost like a constant thing of trial oh. and error where you're just trying to find out. Yeah. I mean, how long did it take you before you really feel like you got into the groove of things and you really found out, you know, oh, if I do this exercise this amount of times and if I do it, you know, on this days, you know, it, you'll get the best results. Oh God. Uh, it's still never been identified. I don't, I know that I work out best in the morning. That's about all I've identified. So I'm a 5 a.m. -er, um, cause otherwise, you know, you get murdered at work and you, there's no way you're going to go after two of my three jobs that I've had have been night jobs. So I always find that fascinating where I'm going to bed at like four or five in the morning. And then most of my guests are getting up to work out. And that's just, yeah. I mean, yeah, I I've tried to work out in the morning before, but yeah, it's just, it just does not end well. So I got to go. It's got to be at least past noon for me to, for me to do anything. Oh, yeah, comes that's to that. about the same for you. So that's, Oh, even, oh, even when, even when I had like a normal sleep schedule, it had to be like that. Where like, if I had to get up, I was just like, I was just like, no, I'm like one of those people where it's like, I don't drink coffee, but it's like, give me at least like two hours to just like relax before I do anything like super strenuous, unless I'm like working, then I'll, then I'll go to work. But like, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm just, I, I, I'm just like that, I guess. But yeah. And that also, I mean, I love to talk about this because it is the most undervalued thing that is not mentioned. I, I don't think at all on Instagram is, you know, sleep. It's the most important thing when it comes to recovery. It's, you know, one of the most important things, you know, ever when it comes to, when it comes to bodybuilding. And I mean, you have to get a proper amount of sleep in order to maintain this lifestyle because, you know, I've had guests on here that, you know, if you're going on four hours of sleep daily, I mean, it's, it's going to catch up to you. So how do you like to set that balance where you're able to get that proper amount of sleep? Because especially when you're in prep, I mean, you're going to be tired a lot, but you're also, it's, it's also going to be hard to sleep when you're hungry and you, you know, you've got those hunger pangs. You're how like do you deal with that? Sleeping on your organs. Yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. So how do you, you deal do with that? Get comfortable. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I probably didn't figure out until I started prepping that I was never getting enough sleep. I can function very well on little sleep. I, for a while suffered from, I say insomnia. It's not like clinically diagnosed, but it took me a while. I'm still not a very good sleeper, but it took me probably until I was 28. So two years ago before I finally got like melatonin and uh, magnesium and various CBD stuff that has finally let me get uh, at least six hours of sleep. So. I just started melatonin like two months ago and I got to say that's been an absolute game changer for me. Like the first time I took it, I was like, oh crap, like 15 minutes later, I was like, oh God, I'm feeling like really, really tired. And it's, yeah like I've heard this all my life but yet I was like well it's not gonna work for me but it does anyone out there yeah melatonin definitely give that a try but I mean we talked about genetics a little bit prior to this but you know it's 
I find that to be some, one of the most fascinating things because some people, you know, they don't realize that, you know, oh, you can't look like that person because genetically, I mean, people's body types are differently. But I always love to say, you know, whenever someone gets started working out, they always have that one body part that really, really takes off that they don't have to train as much. And then they also have that one body part that just legs behind that they have to train to oblivion. I mean, I'll give you mine first. I mean, my back, just because I had jobs all throughout college, you know, working in warehouses where you either got a really nice back or you quit. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. But, you know, I'm also 6'3", so my lower body is just shot to, you know, I, I got to train into overdrive just to get to look like any semblance like I've ever lifted legs. I mean, yeah. I still have those friends in the gym. They're just like, hey, Ryan, you plan on working legs anytime this anytime this year? And I'm just like, dude, you saw me working legs yesterday. It's like, yeah. you know, they, give me a hard, they like to give me a hard time. But what are those body parts for you when you were getting started? Uh, still, so I used to be one that was like, oh, God, I have such big thighs. But now I'm like, no, my thighs aren't big enough. Need bigger quads. Um, so now that I'm in the figure realm of competing, definitely needing my, my legs to catch up, not even catch up. I would say I'm semi symmetrical to upper body to lower, but when you want to get bigger back, you got to get bigger legs too. So I would say those two things are definitely it for me to and you, well, and you said it perfectly too, because a lot of people don't realize with bodybuilding, it's all about the symmetry where it's like, everyone's just like, Oh, why don't they just like try to get as big as they possibly can get? And it's like, yeah, they, they, they do. But symmetry wise, like you don't want to have like just a huge upper body and then just have, you know, like, like just small twigs for legs. I mean, you're not going to, it's not, it's, it's not going to end well. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I like to bring up that question as well, because again, with all the things that the general public doesn't really seem to understand about bodybuilding, I, I definitely feel like that is one of them, but all throughout your training, I mean, there have been so many training fads that have gone on through the health and fitness industry. I mean, I could name 10, 10,000 probably in, in, in my lifetime alone. But one of the things that I've found that a lot of people follow is time under tension. Do you use time under tension at all in your training? Yes. Um, definitely more so my fiance. He is a, I don't even know what uh, exact education he has <laughs> as far as he doesn't use it. That's for sure. That's why I don't know. But he was a trainer, you know, all through college going to Texas Tech. And so he is my trainer. So I do do a lot of eccentric focus time under attention. And that's mostly what I'm doing right now. Yeah, it's it's one of those things, too, where I started a couple of years back and it's it's really, really benefited me. But have you always been in figure or did you start out in bikini or what has your journey been like com competition wise? Yeah, competition wise, I always was figure. Um, I was kind of in the in between because it's like if I did bikini, it was like I had to go straight to the the crazy IFBB league. You know, those girls have probably bigger delts than me in the bikini realm. So, um, so I started in figure, and that was October of 2015. Um, I kind of just decided I was again like un realistically lean 24 seven. And at that point um, I had really gotten into the whole if it fits your macros and had a bunch of people doing bikini around me and they were eating things they didn't want to eat and complaining about their diet. And I'm like, well, why don't you just switch the tilapia for chicken or switch it for something else? Like literally with the same macros, and they're like, Oh, you can't, you know, you can't get competition lean doing if it fits your macros. So it was kind of like a bet. Like I was challenged at that moment. And I was going to prove everyone like, yeah, you can. So that's really why I did that first competition. And then I just evolved into loving the science of it and just watching your body change with little minor tweaks. So other than the nutrition, I mean, doing if it fits your macros, what was your first prep like? Because I love to hear first prep stories because for people out there who might not be familiar, I mean, you can be in amazing shape, but that is nothing, nowhere near to what a prep's going to be like. I mean, you just have to get in a great shape to even go on a prep, but going on a yeah. prep, I mean, you are notching things up to an extreme where, I mean, I always like to say your diet has to be basically near perfect. I mean, you have to get all of your workouts in. I mean, it becomes your life basically for that, for that set amount of time. What was that like the first time you experienced that? Uh, the first time uh, I was in a much easier place as far as life goes. And just my diet was easy. Uh, I think I was much more active as far as, you know, meat goes, quote unquote. So I was eating a lot more. But that prep, I was with a different macros coach who did um, like calorie based cardio. So I had to burn, you know, like X amount of calories per week, which resulted, you know, me looking for the best bang for my buck. So I was doing a lot of Stairmaster, I think like four hours a week. Um, 
but I mean, it was from what I remember. Cause I just came off like the hardest prep of my life. So it was a cakewalk in my brain now. Um, I'm sure at the time I was not thinking that, but as far as food goes, I can remember my carbs, like everything still being, you know, like 180 and this last prep was 90 carbs. So I definitely think my first one was pretty easy. <laughs> so, uh, so other than that, how is, cause you just said you just got off the hardest prep you've been on. How is that different from your first prep? Um, so Matt or calorie wise, my God, uh, the first prep was around 1500 calories, I think was the lowest I got. And this last prep was, um, four day or yeah, four days at at least, I think 1200 calories. So, yeah, I mean, I was the leanest I've ever been and I had to do, you know, the most drastic things I've ever had to do to get there. But whenever you're, I was going into my first, you know, pro show with WMBF this year, as well as the world's competition. So, I mean, desperate times call for desperate measures and I was going to do whatever. So 1200 calories it was, and it was not fun. Yeah. I, yeah. That just, ugh. just, just thinking about that. God, that's just, uh, but again, that just shows the dedication and the drive that, you know, these athletes have, but what is your relationship like with cardio? Is it a love hate relationship or are you just not, are you just like me where you just absolutely hate it? Yeah. Well, no, well, I mean, you have to do a lot more of it. So obviously at the end there, I was doing, um, I think four days a week, 60 minutes, you know, walking on the treadmill. But again, it's like you're walking on the treadmill. So it's just like suck it up and just do it. Um, now I'm doing 30 minutes, obviously. But, so it's like, oh, totally a breeze now. <laughs> but uh, I definitely don't enjoy it. There's some days where you're, it's super nice outside and you're like, you just get that wild hair to want to go for a run because of it. But that's about it. No. And yeah, if you're doing, if you're doing it like that, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, I just, now I have to get on the treadmill now during the winter, but you know, during the summertime, I like to get out for like bike rides and stuff. You gotta, you gotta mix it up because yeah, it just, it just does get really dull and boring. If you're just, if you're just doing the same thing like that. Yeah. Lots of Netflix and cardio. Oh yeah. That's, I mean, that, that's, that's a go-to, but I mean, the most fascinating thing that people do not realize, and I always found to be, you know, I, I didn't understand it until I started this podcast, but the thing that I think impacts competitors and it's probably the hardest thing for these competitors is the posing aspect. I mean, I always say, you know, nutrition's hard enough, working out's hard enough, but for posing, that's, that is the detriment of so many people that we have on. I like to compare it to, you know, you can be a perfect driver. I mean, you can be a great driver. You can never be a perfect driver. You can be a great poser. You can never be a perfect poser. It's always ever evolving. What has your experience with posing been like? Yeah. So it's obviously something I've, you know, improved on, but never perfected. So it's again, like a constant thing to work on because you could be the best, you know, physique up there, but if you don't know how to show it, then you're going to lose and you're going to wonder why, but it's all about what those people see below you. So it's like, how are you going to angle yourself, you know, to where you're keeping that in mind. So I definitely, um, I was very comfortable this past to not as comfortable as I wanted to be for worlds, but um, I definitely had a lot more confidence in my first pro show this year. And then um, I did as well at world, but it was like a different floor and all that kind of stuff goes into it. So yeah, it definitely can make or break you. So that is that and the tan are sadly some of the most important things on the don't um, worry, don't worry, everyone. We'll get into that right after this. But yeah. I got to ask, out of your figure poses, what is your favorite pose to do, and what is your least favorite pose to do? My least favorite is the front pose. I just don't find it very. I don't know. It's just not very feminine. The model pose, which is like one of the side poses, is my favorite. I always said in the unlikely universe where I, you know, ever competed, anything with back would just be my favorite. Just yeah. because, not, 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 not even because of my back. It would be just because that's the one where I could let my smile down just a little bit. Yeah. Where I, where I could just, you know, relax a little bit. But we've had people that, you know, I mean, yeah, we've we've had guests come on and talk about, yeah, yeah, I let my smile down for like 15 seconds and they, you know, dock some points off. So I always say, you know, after these shows, I mean, other than the rest of your body, which is going to be like more sore than it's ever been. Your jawline is probably going to be the thing that's probably going to be the most, most sore out of it. But I mean, 
yeah, it just that whole posing aspect is just so fascinating to me because people don't realize that, I mean, you guys are more sore after your posing sessions than you are for most of your workouts. And it's just yeah. the body is not meant to be in that flex of a state for that long. But yeah. before we go into the tan, I got to ask probably the, another big pain that we hear about all the time is the high heels that they make you guys wear. What is your experience like with those? Did not even phase me whatsoever. But mine are pretty, I don't know. I feel like mine are normal. Well, I was going to say it normally does depend on where you're from, too, because a lot of the people that I have from all the way from up in the north, like they they don't have that much experience in high heels as, you know, I've had a few southern people on and, they, you know, they're like, oh, please, I was born in high heels. Like it didn't matter. It didn't matter. It didn't mean anything to me. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I have found that to be the case, which I mean, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll write some, you know, medical study about that where it's like people born, you know, maybe they're maybe their feet are different. I, I have I have no idea. But and it's not like I wore. I mean, I'm definitely I'm in scrubs 24 seven. I mean, Adidas boost all the time so it's definitely not something where i was like oh i you know wear heels all the time but it just didn't faze me like anything else has yeah that's you know and and that's and that makes it a little bit better for you i guess but now we go on to you know obviously as you can tell i'm one of the palest people you'll ever meet in your entire life i mean just my thick norwegian skin being in the upper midwest where i say you know i can't go outside because i'll either get you know burnt to an absolute crisp or i'll get a farmer's tan where let's be honest that is not a real tan but bodybuilders you know bodybuilders get to get tan and I've always been, you know, I've always wanted to just get tan maybe just for one day in my life. But what is that experience like for you? Because I mean, out of all the negatives that come along with it, where, I mean, you can't really sit on anything, you can't lean up against anything and, you know, just the, the process of getting it put on. But I mean, we always hear, you know, it's amazing seeing, you know, all of your muscles seem to pop out and you see muscles that you never even knew that you had. What is that whole experience like for you when you get that tan on? Yeah. So it is, I mean, you go from not really sure, like, do I have muscles? And, um, unfortunately the day, I mean, it's just constant babying, unfortunately of the tan. That's like what your whole life is dedicated to for the next 24, 48 hours. So for me being a pharmacist, obviously they know, you know, water, sodium, all that is pivotal to filling out. So I was still drinking, still peeing like every two hours. So it was just, I mean, I just hate it. <laughs> We've heard some horror stories, believe me, where, yeah, it's, 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 it's just fascinating. But a question that I ask all my guests, whether it be, you know, up and coming bands, musicians or bodybuilders from my bands, I always ask, you know, what is that feeling like when you get to walk up on stage and perform live in front of hundreds of thousands of people? But that also applies to the bodybuilders. What is that feeling like when you get to walk up on stage and, you know, show off all that hard work that you've worked years upon years on? Yeah. I mean, it is, you know, you get that adrenaline rush or where your heart's like really, really being fast, really <laughs> hoping that you don't trip, you don't, you know, you hit your routine perfectly. And, you know, just knowing um, with bodybuilding in your routines, or not with your routines, but with um, the mandatories where you're being compared to everybody, and they kind of like move you to the center. And it's just like, oh, you know, you're doing something right. Um, so it is, it's a it's just that little 15, well, it's 15 minutes with WMBF because they have you up there forever posing, but <laughs> um, it is definitely a rewarding feeling. Well, I got to ask, what's that like? Because, I mean, I have a, a lot of NPCs, like the vast majority they have on, and sometimes they're only up there for like a minute at the most, but you're up there for 15. So, I mean, what is that like? Do you just do you just have to condition even more because you got it? You're like, oh, I know that for a fact that I'm not just going to be up there for 30 seconds. Yeah. So going into it um, with this federation, this uh, last year was my first time competing with them. Uh, I definitely, all the YouTubes I had found on their mandatories were at least, you know, 15 minutes. So posing was definitely a lot longer. I was holding everything for a minimum of 30 seconds, just going through it. And then it's like, well, you, you got to do it again and you, <laughs> again and again. They, they probably did round like seven, you know, quarter turn complete rounds. Yeah. So. It's a lot different. I love MPC um, as well, but they are definitely more, more cutthroat and quick and not needing as much time. Yeah, they're just basically just trying to shuffle you and get you on and off the stage, you know, as quick as possible. But when you're on stage, even though, I mean, you're on stage for such a longer period of time than the MPC, does time seem to slow down or does it seem to speed up or is it sort of a mixture? Um, trying to think exactly how I felt. Probably slows down just because you're again having to hold these poses for so long um my last npc show i did was last year in october um so that one definitely felt more like flying by 
do you remember where your mind's at when you're up there for 15 minutes? Because I mean, you, you, I mean, if it's your, the adrenaline is eventually going to wear off, you know, if you're up there for that long, like, where does your mind go? Like to try Cause you, I mean, you're just smiling all the time. You can't talk or you can't do anything. Do you just, do you just blank out or zone out basically? No, I mean, it's a constant, like my right shoulder, like externally rotates and to make it match the other one. Like I've got to make sure I'm doing this and I'm doing that. So it's just constantly like, freaking out whether you've got it or you don't got it so well yeah at least at least you have that because i can imagine like if i zoned out and i just be like oh my god just i can't wait to to get off stage yeah but now we go to a fun question what is your go-to post-show meal um so this year we were in new york for worlds and the boston show that we did for uh, WMBF, our pro debut. Uh, we did the same show last year when we went pro, um, and it was the Monster Mash, and it's in Boston. So we love a place called uh, Neptune Oyster Bar. So we made sure to dart ourselves over there before they closed, and it was still like an hour wait. So we always get Mike's cannolis and a lobster roll, and then we obviously had it Worlds, you know, ten days later, so we couldn't do much. But after Worlds. Um, uh, it was like the longest show of my life. So we didn't get done till I think 10 ish. And that was just figure and men's physique. So the show still went on till like 3am, but we darted over to Queens and got Roberta's pizza and some Van Leeuwen ice cream. Well, the only, well, I guess the best thing about having in New York though, is that, I mean, everything's open until, I mean, I don't even know if there's some places that probably don't even ever close. So, you know, that's the one positive there but yeah i always said if i ever competed are definitely the everything like when you step off stage the first we always made sure we had some because we order like hundreds of dollars worth of food online well i i always said you know if i ever competed i would just take a thousand dollars and just go to a five guys and just be like hey i'm buying you out for the night you know just feed me until i puke pass out or throw up you know either way you know i'm i'm getting my money's worth but uh, another thing that I love to talk about on this podcast, and I don't think it's talked about enough on Instagram too as well, is, I mean, most people don't realize that look that you guys put on stage is not a sustainable look. You're not yeah. going to be able to look that way 365 days. And I think a lot of it comes with the fact, I mean, the general public sees shows like Biggest Loser, where, I mean, people go on and they lose, you know, 150 pounds. And some of them are able to keep that weight off just because they've learned the healthy habits. So I think a lot of people just assume that that's the same thing kind of for bodybuilding, where it's like if you guys have worked, you know, just as hard, even harder than some of those people that have lost, you know, dramatic amounts of weight, that you're able to maintain that stage look just because you've worked so hard for it. But people don't realize, like you said, like with a lot of compares where, you know, they manipulate their diet or with the water depletion. I mean, you're not going to be able to look like that what was that like when you first dealt with that and has it gotten easier to accept that and that whole process as your career has gone on i would actually say i mentally talk myself into accepting it more every time i do it but it's like uh, it's gotten probably harder um with every competition um so obviously everyone talks about posho blues not having like any physique goals and not really being able to adhere to their um, reverse dieting and that being like the hardest part now because you know you've got your competition in x amount of weeks and you know messing up is gonna mess that up but now you have two and a half years until your next show so obviously messing up isn't gonna do anything for your physique now so um it's definitely always gotten especially with this show for me knowing like i'm about to go into a long hiatus and off season. So, um, it's hard to get your mind back on that, that you aren't going to stay lean and that you shouldn't stay lean, but you've just seen yourself, you know, with God knows what percent body fat, but, and it's been a long time. So, you know, I was basically that lean at least for eight weeks. And then it's just a matter of like getting those slow tweaks and like losing the legs and losing um, little bits of fat here and there. So after seeing yourself that lean for that long, it's kind of hard to embrace not being. Well, I always say too, it's sort of like starting a business where you got to spend money to make money. You got to put on weight if you want to put on muscle. I mean, yeah. those two, I mean, they, they just go hand in hand, but also, I mean, being a pharmacist, how do you think that you're, you know, ex well, it, it could go both ways. How do you feel that like you're, experience in pharmacy has helped you out with bodybuilding and how do you think that your bodybuilding lifestyle has helped you out in pharmacy um mostly i would maybe say you know schooling helped me with 
bodybuilding, just in the fact, like I said, I'm never going to water deplete. I'm never going to sodium deplete, uh, knowing what I know about, you know, filling out. So, um, and again, just like the melatonin asleep, various herbal aspects like that, um, definitely helped me be the best I could be. So. And that's awesome. And two of the questions that I love to ask all of our health and fitness guests that we have on for the first one, I mean, there've been so many positive things that have happened, you know, since I got, you know, bigger and stronger, but the one negative thing is that you're going to get asked to move a lot of people's furniture. You're going to get asked to open a lot of pickle jars or bald water or anything that's sealed on tight. You're basically the go-to strength person. I'm still at home with my parents for the next two months before I move out. And every single time they come with groceries, I basically have to lift the car into the driveway and carrying the groceries. Has that been a similar experience with you, especially, you know, being a pharmacist and working in that where, I mean, just especially when you're getting close to competition where people just assume that you can do favors for them, just looking at you. Yeah. But you're really like dead inside. Yeah. They don't, they don't understand that unless they're really, really your friends, but yeah, definitely at work. I'm definitely the person that moves, you know, the giant water jug onto the dispenser and various labels and all that kind of stuff. But it's okay. I take it as a compliment. Well, I always, I always said too, you know, it's it, it's it's interesting getting used to. But I, I mean, being six foot three too. I mean, you, I, I was always, you know, I'm gonna get asked to move stuff even if I had zero muscle at all. Just you know, being the tall guy, so it was an adjustment for me. But also going off that question, but not the second question. I mean you don't look like the average looking person because you're a bodybuilder. So, I mean, what is that experience? Like, I like to compare it to, you know, like if you were to walk out, like looking like you look right now, I mean, you're going to get stares and you're going to get, you know, just people just get fascinated by it. You're kind of, you're kind of like a mini celebrity when you go out then. What has that experience been like? And has it, have it, has it been easier for you to adjust to that as your career has gone on? Yeah. I've kind of always been one that didn't really care. And I've been lucky that my fiance, I was, uh, we met in 2000 right after my first show. So 2016, he's definitely one that has always embraced me. We did a 50 pound bulk together and all sorts of stuff. So, um, I'm definitely accepting of my physique in that matter. And even some women, you know, think you're too, too something all the time, but others are like really about this whole new, you know, embracing of muscular women and they want my arms and they want my shoulders and stuff like that. So I guess what what were you and your husband eating for a 50 pound bulk? (laughs) Well, I mean, 50 pounds coming off of stage. Oh yeah. yeah. So I was coming off stage at 121 pounds and I got up to 160. So I was basically in that mindset. We knew we were going to compete and it was kind of just an experiment. You know, you hear, oh, I'm going to get my calories as high as possible so that I can cut on, you know, higher calories. So we were people that bought into that. And the sad reality is, is nope, your body knows, <laughs> knows what you just did to it. Um, so it was fun, but we had a lot of food vacations, that's for sure. So. Yep. Yeah. Again, that's why I don't like talking about it on the podcast. I'm starting to drool right now. Jeez. I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to go and eat, have something to eat right after this. But my favorite question to ask, because I mean, I always say fit guys have their own problem when it comes to, you know, finding clothes that, 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 you know, help them with their lifestyle and, you know, have a nice wardrobe, but for fit women, I mean, the moment that you said you had your shoulders really, really took off. I was like, if you have big, broad shoulders, dresses, aren't your best friend. Jeans are another thing that we hear of all the time, where if you have a big lower body and a small waist, good luck with that. What have been some ways that you found that you're able to compensate for the fact that your clothing options can be very limited and the fact that you basically have to have two wardrobes, your prep wardrobe and your off season wardrobe. Yeah. So for one, you do not buy into the prep wardrobe. Um, you just let it be spandex and things that can grow and shrink with you. Um, but I found good tailors that do tacking is what it's called, where you just bring in, it's eight bucks. So you can buy your pants to fit your legs and then they just tack in the waist and you're good to go. Um, upper body is still a little annoying because of course us women, we want fitted clothes and then it's like, well, are the sleeves going to fit my biceps or all that kind of stuff. So it's like, well, they fit them now, but if I put on five pounds of fluff onto them, you know, I'm not going to fit into this jacket. So I definitely don't buy into the prep wardrobe for sure. Yeah. I was going to say whoever invented, you know, like 
spandex or whatever like that. I mean, they must be making a fortune. But if anyone out there, you know, has anything fashion wise to help out, you know, I'll, I'll, they'd become a millionaire just by selling to all the guests that I've had on my show. Because it's like every single one of them, they need clothing options. And it has been getting better. But I mean, it, it needs to it needs to get, I think, significantly better because, I mean, yeah, there's so many times where it's just like, yeah, it's not I mean, wearing workout clothes is fine. But if you're wearing them like every day, it's like after a while, you're just like, I kind of want to look nice, you know, every once in a while, you know, so. So, yeah, absolutely. But Spanx leggings, they make some pretty, pretty leggings and they, they will fit me uh, when I just got off my hunt prep. So at 125 pounds, and then they also fit me in my bulk at 160. So they are the answer. Yeah. And again, Not anyone that will be, yeah. Well, yeah. And anyone going, going, check that out for sure. But if, <laughs> uh, if someone were to walk up to you and say, you know, Maggie, we made the decision. You can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. What would be one thing that you'd like to see changed? Uh, of course we can all say, um, me being in figure, you know, they all will NPC has specified, you know, they're going to try to not focus on or fixate and reward the people that are just massive and they're going to go back to symmetry specifically and this, this and that. Um, so it'd have to obviously just be, you know, to keep the divisions, how they, I mean, it's give and take because I wouldn't be in this bodybuilding, you know, hobby if it didn't revolve around improving something, you know, they've kind of created that. And so it's hard for me to tell them to change that, um, aspect of judging, but, uh, that would definitely be to reel it in a little before there's no lines between figure and physique and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's one thing we've heard. We've heard too, but I heard they're coming up with, is, isn't it like a wellness division that they're trying to yeah. come up with? Yeah. So it's kind of like yeah. a mixture between those two where it's kind of a yeah. stepping stone. Yeah. So yeah. Cause a lot of the, um, especially like Brazilian women and um, some competitors over like in Australia and UK, they are. That have two foot long butts basically. Are... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So they're at least going to reward them for that instead of, you know, making them not train their legs. They they have the lower bodies where like, it makes you wonder how they function as a human being basically. Yeah. I, I was like, I do figure and I need your legs. Y'all are like, freak so mm -hmm. yeah no i've i've definitely seen some of those on instagram and i'm just like okay that's i mean it would be fun to live like that for one day but after a while it's like that would be a hassle though if you're that if your lower body was that big just like walking through doors and stuff like that like if it yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah that's, you know that's but yeah and, and that, that just goes to show i mean the most popular answer that we've ever gotten on this is you know i always said if you were to compete in back-to-back -back shows on back-to-back -back weekends the judging can be so bipolar when it comes to what they want. I mean, the one show they might want you super lean and the one show they might, might want, you know, a little bit, a little bit more cut and they are a little bit more fluff too. They might just want just their looks just constantly change to, to just come up with a, you know, a universal judgment that they, that they like for the, for what, what they want. And so that, that would be definitely my thing if I ever, if I ever had a say, but if we, if we were to talk to you, well, actually before I ask this question, so I know we'll go into this now. Powerlifting. You've we talked about before we started. I was I totally was forgot about that, but we're gonna talk about that now because I mean you have started and you're you're doing powerlifting now and how what in, what made you want to go into powerlifting and how has that been how has your powerlifting journey been compared to your bodybuilding journey? So I uh did CrossFit at a really good gym in Savannah when I was in pharmacy school. So I had always, and again, going back to high school and softball, had always, you know, squat, deadlifted, bench. Um, so after my um, first show in 2015, I'm again a very competitive person. I kind of just picked that versus going back to CrossFit. I went back to training for powerlifting and I have a bunch of USPA meets, you know, available in Texas, just like NPC. So um, they made it really easy to just pick a show. And I had a bunch of friends from just the Facebook, you know, if it fits your macros world that had experience with powerlifting programs and like peaking for meets and whatnot. So they just helped me with that. And, um, you know, I just became strength strength goal obsessed and instead of physique and my first meet um I was I, I did well with USPA versus USAPL um just based on the weight classes so I was the leanest well I was the smallest in 
my class. So um, I never won per se, but as far as my Wilkes go and stuff like that, sadly, I can't even remember. But um, I had the best meets being smaller than I did when I was actually bulking. So i um, still kind of playing around with that idea now as far as staying in weight classes go. How does your training differ from bodybuilding to powerlifting? Because, I mean, with powerlifting, it's a, it's so much more about strength, whereas bodybuilding, it's, you know, you, you don't have to lift the heaviest weight. It's about the aesthetic, and it's about, you know, yeah. getting the muscles to pop. But how how does your training differ between the two sports? So for now, until I definitely dedicate to a meet or anything like that, it's mostly just um, still that I call them power, power builder programs where you've got your main lift. Um, that I fixate as far as my RPE goes and um, progressing with that. And then afterwards, I have my accessory movements, which I still am RPE-based, but um, more so just getting that extra volume to get growth and hypertrophy. So, When you know you're going to compete in a powerlifting meet, do you change up your nutrition at all in order to maybe get bulkier or maybe get, uh, change your look, or do you like to keep it where it's at, you know, even in the office? Yeah, I like to um, definitely compete wherever I, whatever I'm at. I don't want to, I've done a weight cut and I actually won the meet, but it was the hardest like thing of my life. As far as I felt like I was, I, the day of the meet, I felt like my body hurt. Um, I did a water load, but still my body, I, I barely made weight just because I cut water off at, I think 7 PM, but, uh, it's like I quit peeing, I quit doing everything. So I barely made weight and I just felt like death the next day. So I definitely just like to compete wherever I'm weighing. What is your favorite powerlifting lift and what is your least favorite powerlifting lift? My least favorite now is squat. It used to be one of my favorites, but I have, um, I'm not sure how, I think probably just so, or, um, adductor tightness, but I just had a lot of hip issues. Um, that's kind of why I took some time away from squatting in general. I've just got back to it for probably since a year and a half now. So I'm back to squatting, but, um, favorite, uh, it's kind of a tie between I have a love hate with deadlift. I can lift really well and heavy with it, but right now I'm fixating again on keeping my hips happy. So I'm doing a lot of like form specific, like slow, you know, off the ground. And so I hate it right now, but bench I've always been good at until I dislocated my thumb. Um, so it's still kind of painful, the heavier weight I get. How did, how did that happen? How'd you dislocate it? Um, being an idiot, I was doing floor presses and I was really lazy and I was just like, Oh, I'm going to set this weight off over here. And then it bent my thumb completely backwards. So yeah. 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 The, 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 the worst thing I ever did was, uh, I had it, I had a bench thing fall on my chest, but I, luckily I didn't like crack anything or like break anything, but yeah, it's everyone. Yeah. Even if you're, you know, don't, don't be like that, you know, make sure that you're, that you're staying safe in the gym, especially because, especially when you're competing too, and you know, your brain gets really foggy and you know, yeah, she knows, she knows what I'm talking about. I've never experienced that, but we've heard so many prep brain stories where I just, you know, ugh, yeah, I, I can't, I can't imagine. But if we were to talk to you a year from today, where would you like to be at in your bodybuilding or your powerlifting? Where would you like to be at in your, you know, health and fitness journey? If we were to talk a year from today, uh, a year from today. I would like to be better uh, in my aspect of right now I'm, you know, in this reversing world of my diet and, you know, not in competition. So I would like to have a better grasp on eating intuitively. I've logged, you know, for my, I don't even know how long I've been logging macros. Um, and it's kind of just one of those, especially to hit protein. I just think it's hard not to. But I would like to be in a place where I'm at a steady weight. Um, you know, I'm happy with my body and I'm able to eat intuitively while still, you know, finding myself progressing in the gym. And hopefully by then, definitely with some bigger quads and lats. Um, and with a, let's see, what month is it? December. So probably, hopefully I've already completed a powerlifting meet. 
That's awesome. And since we do have the holidays coming up very, very shortly, what do you like to do nutritional wise? Do you, do you let yourself enjoy it? Or are you one of those people that we have on that just still really, you know, Hey, I got to get, you know, my macros, right. Or, or do you just say, Hey, it's the holidays. Um, I'm kind of the, one of those, Hey, it's the holidays. Um, definitely a majority of the week. If I know I have, you know, Thanksgiving or whatever on Thursday, and I'm not going to be eating crap food. Monday through Friday, even if it's, you know, hitting my macros, um, just for the sake of God knows what's going to happen on Thanksgiving. So I like to still keep a good, you know, relationship with food and not engorge myself or think, you know, oh, I can only have this now. So make sure I get it all. So I definitely try to practice that around the holidays. But yeah, it's definitely it's 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 tough even for me okay and i don't even compete so i can't even imagine what that must be like but two of the final questions that i that i love to ask i mean what would you say is the biggest misconception that the general public has about female bodybuilding um of course it's again the everybody has to do steroids or is doing steroids um female bodybuilders and then they i think it's getting a lot better as far as you know not being a lifting weights or trying just to tone i barely hear tone anymore so it must be getting better (laughs) um so those are definitely the biggest two is that it's super easy to gain muscle and that you gotta watch out or you're gonna get too bulky i do have to warn people though you have to watch out for there's there's one out of like every ten thousand. those just absolute genetic freaks where like they they I was friends with one of them. Well, I still am. And literally, I don't think he's ever lifted a weight his entire life, but he can go through 10 Snickers bars a day and doesn't, yeah. doesn't gain an ounce of fat where it's just like, oh my God. I, I was like, I, I hope that he's getting like a really bad trick played on him and it's going to catch up to him one of these days. But like, yeah, he definitely rubs it in everyone's faces. But yeah, so I have to warn everyone. There's like that one person out of the 10,000 where you're just going to hate them. And you're just like, dude, I, I you're just the luckiest person on the planet. But yeah, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree with you more on that. And is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to uh, before we wrap things up? Um, Shout out to my coach, Team Pro Physique, Paul Ravel. Um, and shout out to anyone who's, you know, aspiring on this journey, especially women. Um, I'm glad that it's gotten easy for us. It's not like it's been that hard. Not like women's suffrage talk here, but <laughs> it's definitely uh, for me being a trap queen was hard growing up so it's nice that at least uh people are getting into that so shout out to anyone trying to get bigger and get stronger i've kept quiet about this for about an hour but do you train traps now at least because like dude they're honestly they're about they're popping out of the screen it's like come on it's like yeah anytime uh, zach puts them in my programming just because we basically do the same workouts i'm like okay i'm gonna do something else but <laughs> but you have fun. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, like, as soon as, as soon as she caught, answered the screen, I was like, oh, trap queen, yeah, for sure. Like that, I, I literally just said that, said that in my head. But yeah, and that's, you know, and that's, and that's awesome, and that's, and that's so great. But lastly, if you're just walking down the street and someone comes up to you and says, you know, like, wow, you look amazing. I want to look like that and get started on my journey. What's the best piece of advice that you like to try to give people to get started, you know, adapting a healthy and fit lifestyle? Because I find that, you know, just taking that first step is the hardest thing for so many people. And it's, I mean, I always say, if you take that, if you take that step into the gym, it's very hard to walk out of the gym without getting a workout in. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So I do hear that. And the first thing I make sure I preface with is, you know, I have been doing this for a decade, (laughs) literally at least a decade. I'm 30 years old and I definitely started like really progressing with weights when I was 20. So um, I definitely say time is, you know, and the later you get started, obviously it's the harder it is. So just getting started is, you know, the best thing you can do and that you should be proud of um, just because you don't look like me yet. So um, just give it time and give it consistency. Well, it goes in perfectly too, like what we were just talking about with genetics. I mean, you're not going to end up looking like her. I mean, you're going to look like the best version of yourself. That's what I always tell people. It's like, just strive to be the best version of yourself. And yeah, I mean, so many people, especially in this day and age with the technology, they see photos of people and they're like, Oh, I want his abs or I want her legs. Or it's just, people don't realize just, just, you're not going to be able to look like that. And first of all, you don't know what they're doing to enable to look like that. So, I mean, yeah, that's just why I love to bring that up at the very end here, because 
if there's any message that I can get out from this podcast, it's just, you know, just be the best version of yourself and just realize that, you know, you have no idea what other people are going through. You have no idea about all that other stuff that how they maintain that look or, you know, how just their genetics, especially with this, but it, just in life in general. I mean, just, just be your best version of yourself. And again, Maggie, we cannot thank you enough for coming on the podcast. I, I really, really appreciate it. I mean, I love having guests come on and share their stories. So again, thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to do it with, women bodybuilders and everybody in the fitness industry. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I said, I said one of the reasons why I love talking to women bodybuilders over male bodybuilders, because first of all, ha- having conversations with guy bodybuilders, this is how it goes. <laughs> hey, how much you lift? And then that's it. That's yeah. all. That's about, that's, about, that's about all it is. So, you know, yeah, it's a, you can get a little bit more conversation in with them. That's just because, you know, I was raised in that, in that sort of that, that culture yeah. where it's just, yeah, it's, bro. yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't really get more, you don't really get more philosophical past that question really when you're talking. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, and, and yeah, it's, it's my pleasure having you on. So again, you guys go and check out Maggie. I'll leave a link to her Instagram page down below. I'm just going to warn you ahead of time. You will get inspired to get off those couch, that couch and stop eating those Twinkies because, you know, or you will get inspired to, you know, go on these food ventures and then go that too. You know, deadlift something right after. Well, that too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you will. You will get inspired. So Maggie, again, thank you so much for coming on. And this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing out. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.